delving into Penang history, casting light on the Scots, the brown lights, and the yellow browns.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome all. Uh, this very hot Saturday afternoon to Penang Institute. Uh, quite a crowd, we're happy to see. We will be talking history today in a very local fashion. More directly, we will start by discussing some early settler families in Penang and allow that to, to give us new angles into our own past. As we know, the past is another country, as they say. Now, of course, we're talking history, and history is a subject that tends to suffer from, for want of a better word, it's to suffer from presentism, which is that you know we live in the present and we look back, and what we see are not exactly what happens. Right? That, that's always a problem in in the subject, and history for being a novel discipline as well. In most societies, it's not something that is part of, of people's culture. So history is in many ways a very contested subject that needs to be developed further. There's always a lack of data and a lack of subjective data. And of course, we, there's always this preference for stories to be dramatic and sensational and so on, which of course clouds the issues very, very often. Well, we, we could, of course, begin by asking when did Penang become multicultural or was it ever anything else? And what is multicultural anyway? Uh, today, does the street of harmony show that we, are, we have been multicultural and harmonious or does it show us something else? What did colonial knowledge do to our understanding of our own history? What is nationalism? doing to our own self-understanding. This is, of course, necessarily an, an arena of contest. Likewise, what is this age of nations that we are living in doing to our aspirations and our self-understanding as well? These are important questions to discuss. I don't know exactly yet uh, what the content of Dr. Sri Lim Chong Kiet's uh, talk to us today will be, but I'm sure it will have an impact on these lines of questioning in succinct ways. Now, before I hand the floor over to him, of course, I should... It feels a bit unnecessary to try to introduce him, really, right? But he has asked that I say a few, few words about his, his past connections uh, that are relevant to what he's going to say today. Uh, he, was once the, he was the founder chairman of the Penang Heritage Trust, of course and a mem an active member of the museum board once upon a time and of the botanic gardens and the state culture council as well and he was also once the chairman of the rate penang rate, Play rate payers association i would actually simply just say that that the sri lim chong Kiet is one of the last renaissance persons at penang i hope not one of the last but one of the few uh, renaissance person that Penang has, has produced. So um, to get things started, I think I shall just pass the floor over to him now. Please welcome Dr. Sri Lim Chong Kiet. Uh, thank you. Does this work? Is it on? Hello. Uh, thanks, Ki Beng. Uh, actually, I must start by saying that I'm not a historian. So let me say, how many historians are there in the audience? Well, when I published this historically, which is almost 50 years ago, this is not a collector's item. It was really done for the bicentenary of the founding of Penang. And uh, without being a historian, it was very bad it, as in history in Penang Free School because I cannot remember dates. So if I get the dates wrong, please correct it in the records here. But not only that, when I published this book, I was actually interested in the topographical history environmental evidence and incidentally jumping the gun we hope to be producing a sequel to this a new edition which will have a hundred new images which have not yet been seen and my collaborator is none other than marcus langdon who's also not a historian because technically you have to have a phd according to the historians in fact when we showed this book to the royal asiatic society group a very eminent penang historian who's dead now, so I better not mention his name, uh, was asked whether he's read my book. He said, no, no, no. He's not a historian, so I don't read his book. 
So the narrow part, of course, recently I'm also declared a non-botanist because although I've discovered many species, I'm not a botanist because I don't have a PhD in botany. But they don't realize the great works in the past are all done by amateurs. And all of you can be historians and botanists too by my edict. Okay. Now, I was actually stimulated and I stuck my neck out to do this talk and uh, Penang Institute felt that it was okay to accommodate me on a Saturday afternoon because I read in the papers an interview made by Wong Chun Wai, who might be invited here. I don't think he's will be here because he's too busy, interviewing the author that launched a book here on the history of Penang. Now, I have not, not, nothing against authors who use history as a launching pad for their book. And there are many, many authors. Um, some of you may be here, actually. So forgive me if I... Uh, make any, any implications. History is open to everybody to interpret. But today, even on the internet, you will find so many errors. And in fact, just before lunch, I checked a website and I saw certain errors. So it's really the reinterpretation that gives us a lot of trouble. However, I'm going to, as I say, lightheartedly tell you about certain families in Penang but before that, maybe we we'll just flash through the images uh, in case you do not know what has been here. So this was a book published in, uh, when was it, uh, 1986. And it so happened that in the museum board, which was very active then, I don't know what's happened to it now, we were able to collect a lot of images. And it started with two images, which I'll show you later, by James George was Lord Minto's assistant, and he did paintings of Penang. We showed Penang when he came here. And it was available on, on the market outside, so I persuaded a generous person in Penang to donate it to the Penang Museum. This was the beginning of the collection. In this book, you will see many pictures, and Glugo House is what we're going to talk about, the seat of the Brown family. You have, this is an interesting view from behind uh, Glugo House, uh, because you will know later that all these equitants, allegedly by Robert Smith around uh, 1815, were duplicated as equitants by William Daniel. And this one doesn't appear in that set of 10. And similarly, in that set of 10, you have one of Strawberry Hill, which doesn't appear in the original watercolors. In the new edition, we're actually going to debate whether these paintings were actually by Smith. Because in those days in Britain, there are studios where a lot of things are reproduced and copied and so on. So that's Suffolk House. Now this is way after the period we're going to talk about. But just, and this is uh, North Beach, which is a painting I still own. Mount Erskine and the Great Tree which is still a mystery botanically, but we more or less know where it was. It's on the Rilau Valley, when you go across where that flyover is at the moment. And, but the, the species is still got to be determined. And the Dugate Waterfall, these were celebrated, they were tourist sites of Penang, and everybody went up there to look at them. And the famous view from Convalescent of Bel Retiro. Uh, notably, you can see the Tanjong, the Cape, uh, on the right-hand side, and you see the mainland on the other side. Uh, and I have to mention this because uh, on the left is an area which was the first botanic garden of Penang Hill, which is now where the Curtis Crest is by Habitat. Uh, we should wonder why it was actually put there, because this actually was a historical site, and hopefully it can be restored as an important botanical site for Penang Hill. This is Halliburton's Hill, which is where Bellevue Hotel is at the moment. You can see the view of Plau Jaja at the background, and even uh, the tea kiosk at the back, David Brown's. So that view is more or less intact, of course, with the bridges in the view. And Army's Mill. Army was a very wealthy uh, flour, mill, uh, flour miller, and this is right at the bottom of the Penang Hill Railway, where the big block of flats have been built and Suffolk House. These paintings were actually quite highly idealized. 
And I think I've repeated this one. And there, funny enough, there were three other paintings acquired by the residency. So they were duplicated, three of them. Now, all of these except two were given to the Penang State Museum. And I don't know whether there's anybody from the museum here. I hear that they've been damaged severely in the basement of the Penang Museum. And in fact, I see one member of the museum board formerly. What has happened? Why are these most important paintings left in the basement and are still not being restored? So accountability in history and archival work is something that we should question. What has happened to all the great things that was done historically 50 years ago? This is actually the only authentic painting by Robert Smith. It was done practically in situ of Army's Mill which I happen to have acquired. Maybe I have to put this on sale for my old age pension fund. Now, these are the Aquitans by Willem Daniel, who is more famous than Smith, actually, but again, idealized. Now, I will give you a preview. The site of Grugor House is not what some authors said where the Minden Barracks are. It's actually opposite the uh, uh, training college. Where it was called Telegraph Hill, where there was a a whole lot of quarters near the roundabout. Nearer the roundabout than Minden, <coughs> yeah, than Wrexham. And actually, my memory goes back to early days where we saw the entrance to this place. And it was called Begby Stables because the horse uh, trainer, Begby, owned that site. And there was a site for the house. I don't know when it was knocked down, but jumping the gun, the last supervisor for the Proud Estate which included Sunai Ara, a Dr. Ward, Mr. Ward. I visited him in Sunai Ara, and I rescued the bathtub of Drugo House for the Penang Museum. I hope it's still there. The bathtub was retrieved, and so this is a real link. So maybe they should charge for people to have a bath in their bathtub, the original Drugo House. Even museums have to make money, I guess. So that's Drugo House. Again, uh, mind you, these are done much after the days of Scott and Light. And uh, so the dates you have to remember, again, very idealized, although the river is still there. And see what's happened to it. Actually, under the State Culture Council, we tried to look at the restoration of all these sites. And we even looked at, there was a, a temple nearby, by there. And a lot can be done if you really knew the visual history of the of, of Penang. The famous view of North Beach, where you more or less see where the St. Saviour's the convent is. And that was where the aqueduct was, because they took the water from the waterfall to that location for the ships, and also they bathed the horses there and so on. You can see Penang Hill, you can see Flagstaff Hill, you can see uh, Mount Erskine on the right, and a hill next to the botanic garden called Mount Sophia, am I right? Mount Olivia or Mount Sophia? Mount Olivia. Sophia was the last next wife that I went to. So that is actually just on the top of Penang Botanic Garden where the ruins are still there. So again, the repeat of the view from Convalescent and Halliburton's Hill. Now, one of the things we reproduced and drew and in this set, by the way, are available. So not that we're trying to broadcast it, but the, the whole set are available. And we redrew this panoramic view from the center of the channel, which identified all the key landmarks you can see on Penang Island and on Pry. So it's a worthwhile acquisition if you really want Penang history, because the reproductions are almost as accurate as the original prints. Now, we also had, at the time, we started collecting maps of it's not very clear, but they're all in, in the, the book. This is uh, 1835, 32, and Elvis, 1763. You see, Penang actually had been discovered long before Francis Light by Lancaster in the 15th century, of course, by Cheng Ho in the 14th, 14 something or other, who landed in Batu Mound, and the alleged footprint of Cheng Ho is still there. So it wasn't exactly an abandoned island. And on the western side, I'm sure there were many settlers which are not accounted for. And the connection with Sumatra, 
where the Bataks were, and Bataks came over living here, and many of them became part of Francis Wright's household. They were his slaves, the Batak people. So these guys were actually having slaves. It was a slave-owning period. This one is the James Scott, the plan, is that he was a very interesting, whether he was a pirate or not, but they call them privateers, and I'll talk about him later. So these are early maps, and even where people coming into Penang from the south, and then the landing by light was as recorded very well by Trepo. Alicia Trepo uh, not only re uh, described it, but published a book, which actually has a copy. I hope the museum has a copy. And he actually also painted the view of the fort, which at the moment some people are trying to restore, but uh, it was a failed fort, actually. There's another view from the fort looking towards where the town hall is at the moment. So we have very interesting topographical history and the view from the sea. And that was an early, one of the earliest pictures of Fort Cornwallis. And one of the earliest map by Popham, which has actually been copied by many people without my, I don't know whether they got it from my book, but you can see the, set, the beginning of the layout of all the, the streets, uh, China Street and so on, all there in the fort. Later, they tried to extend the fort to cover a bigger area, but fortunately, that did not happen. So we do have a record, and e even the early maps. Uh, this one actually showed on the left-hand side where Suffolk House was supposed to be, but actually, it's not completely correct. Now we'll talk about Francis Wright. It's well recorded, and on the internet, you can look up as well. And interestingly, he remembered a lot of people, including the relative of Martina Ressels. So not only his own children. And incidentally, I happened to have obtained a copy to one of the last of the Browns, Helen Miller, whom I met in 1995. And at the back of this particular copy was a sketch. Now, it could be conjectured that this might have been a sketch of Francis Wright. Now, the will was actually made in October 1784, just before he died, two days before he died. And the person that was the witness, one of the witnesses, is a guy called Nathaniel May Bacon, who actually owned most of the area in Kampong Melayu in Ayatam, an area then called Otahiti Estate, because they all had been involved with the bounty, coming back, trying to bring breadfruit to this part of the world. And Nathaniel Bacon owned that area. He was also the one of the witnesses of Francis Wright's uh, will. Incidentally, I believe he bequeathed all his property to the Sight family. So Sight Aidit's grandparents actually owned that area by bequest from Nathaniel Bacon. Because B Bacon, being a pork eater, uh, gave it to this Muslim family, a rather interesting descent. So these, the history of these names are uh, quite well recorded. Now, Sarah Light. The first of Light's children, three girls, Sarah, Mary, Lucky, and the two sons, uh, William, founded Adelaide. And I see on the way here, there's a signboard about Penang Adelaide uh, history, which I will actually allude to. Well, Sarah Light was actually born in Phuket when Light actually, as in this will said, he cohabited with Martina Rosales. So they were never married. So actually, all their children are bastards. And I'll jump the gun, up, maybe I'll wait a bit. Sarah Light married uh, Welsh, but this is one of the sketches of William Light, the founder of Adelaide, who was actually born in Kedah. And this is another picture of him from the Adelaide uh, Museum or art gallery, the two pictures of here. Now, the funny thing was that when the first Adelaide Penang meeting came, that whole delegation was a bit uh, ceremonial, and I was asked to give them a talk in the city council building. So I thought being Australians, they have a good sense of humor. I said, you might like to know that your founder was a double bastard, you know, because 
the, the Australians refer to the Brits as pommy bastards in an affectionate way. Am I right? I don't know if they still do that. But Now, we heard about the white Australian policy. When somebody restored those paintings, they found that underneath this white complexion was actually a dark person, a brown person. So they're very embarrassed because behind this, somebody quite washed the portrait of William Light in Adelaide. So this is a fact which I was told by Don Dunstan himself, who came and inaugurated the Penang Adelaide meeting. So why did I call him a double bastard? Firstly, Francis Light wasn't married to Martina Rosell. He cohabited and all his children were therefore bastards. But Light himself was a bastard because his mother was Mary Light. But Light wasn't his father's name. Who then was the father of Francis Light? It's alleged that the squire of Darling Who was his father. So you can take the conjecture, but actually I visited Darling Who and looked at the graveyard of Mary Light. I gave them a copy of the book and uh, well, they had actually forgotten the history of Penang. But anyway, there is that connection so in Suffolk House. In Suffolk, the Darling Who is still there and people make a thing about how Francis Light scratched on the pane of the glass and all that kind of thing. But there it is. The Maoris at that time were such that especially when they went overseas, they were actually non-racial except that they were actually snobbish guys, particularly in India, who always talked about the tar brush. But already in the history of the world, intermarriages are legion. And even, we are talking about Swedish people, the Swedes were the biggest trade, uh, slave traders in, in Europe, even before the Brits. And they brought back so much black genes into, Swed into Swedish uh, thing. This is recorded genetically. You want to use DNA, you can check it still today. But in the history of the world, as long as people travel outside their kampong, intermarriage is absolutely natural. But there will always be people who are snobbish about it. And so it was in Penang. Because there's a guy called Major MacDonald who actually looked down on both Light and Scott. Because they were firstly, Scott was walking around wearing sarongs. And uh, also cohabiting with uh, local people. So there was a kind of snobbery. And uh, if you read the letters complaining between McDonald and Light uh, to the East in the company, you would find it rather interesting. I don't know whether I should stop here. Yeah, I think here I want to mention the other son of Francis Light, whose name is Francis Lanoon Light. Now the word is Lanoon. It's actually a pirate, essentially, not only the Bugis, but the people from the north of Sabah, the Lanoons. And what happened? Why did Francis Light name his son Lanoon, Francis Lanoon Light? By the way, he became quite famous. And one of the texts I want to instigate as a result of this conference, this meeting, is to trace the descendants. Because Lanoon Light knew Sanford Raffles and was a friend of Raffles, and he was made the governor of Bangka. He married a Javanese Eurasian, by uh, whose name you can get, and their children, one of the last was known living in Tlok Anson in Perak. So a very interesting social history is to find the descendants of all these people. Lanun Light was born in 1790 or 91. In fact, the history mixes the two dates over this incident called the Pry Incident. Now also the historians mixed up when they refer to the Sultan of Kedah. There were three Sultans of Kedah involved in the, uh, the founding of Penang. The first guy who Light represented from the East India Company is number one. But his successor was unhappy with the terms because I think it's very clear that they were not sure whether Penang was being sold or rented. 6,000 or whatever, that's not the whole point. So anyway, the next Sultan was unhappy and apparently started to attack Penang in, 19, in 1790 by assembling his forces in Pry, 
along the river. The figures say they had 10,000 people and 400 Bugis mercenaries ready to attack Penang. Well, according to the British side, of course, with a mere 400 sepoys, they stopped, preempted the strike and dissipated the, the forces on the other side and won the victory. Therefore, uh, they renegotiated and uh, so they won the victory. So that victory was the occasion because those Lanuns were also there and Francis Wright named that occasion uh, Lanun like. Now, amongst other things which I should come to later, was the only known diary of the visit to Penang, which gives us the first eyewitness of the meeting with Light and Martina Rosells, by a lady called Anna Maria Davis, who visited Penang in 1791. And funny enough, as I was researching, because after doing this book, we started to collect a lot more material, which has been delayed until now, when we are ready to do the new edition. And it was sent to me by her, 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 one of her descendants from Canada when they knew that we were researching on Penang history. So the diary of Amar, Anna Maria Davis, which frankly I'm still trying to find the original copy sent to me, has been recorded and I've given it to several historians who had uh, taken excerpts from that. And they visited Martina Rosell's, Francis Light living in Martina Rosell's house, which is actually where Lee Street Gorge is, next to the playground of the convent. And it's called Martina's Lane. And according to Maria, uh, Anna Maria Davis, Martina spoke no English. But do we interpret to be true? Probably she refrained from talking English to this English woman. But her record is that she did not speak English but she was very courteous and so on. And they were, of course, being brought around by the British military guys because they were just, uh, young ladies were rather scarce. So they were taken all around to parties and so on, the social world it's called. And they visited Suffolk Park. Now, during the Adelaide meeting, somebody wrote to Kosukun that Suffolk House was built by Francis Light, which is, rubbish because it's well documented that Light did not build Suffolk House. It was actually built much later by Phillips and uh, uh, the son-in-law after the Light family had to sell the properties and so on. So they only had a hut there and I remember the phrase used by Maria Davis that it resembled the Queen of Tonga's hut. They had a grand time. Suffolk Park was just a, a kind of outdoor place to have a party. So that completely debunks the history of Suffolk House being owned by Francis Light. So we can pick up all these things from courts. And uh, then let's go over, of course, Light died, and his will is also rather interesting because he bequeathed everything to uh, Martina and, in fact, defined her as having cohabited with him, never called him his wife, cohabited with him since 1772, and also provided for all the children. William was sent back to England uh, and actually never came back to Penang unless he went, stopped here on the way to Adelaide and was in, a, in the charge of Doughty, one of Francis Light's friends. And later Sarah Light came and so on. But to me, interesting, he lists his Batak slaves and allowed them to release themselves by the payment of a sum, I think $50 or something like that, to become free persons. And he listed his other retainers, which had Siamese or Chinese names. So they had a lot of slaves, they had a lot of uh, uh, pe uh, people working in the household. So they're all mentioned there. And I like to think it'd be interesting if you can identify the descendants of all those people that came from that household and later from the Brown and the Scott household. Now, the three houses along Scotland Road was owned by the Scott family. And who is James Scott? Well, it's well known that he's related to Sir Walter Scott, but he's a different branch. And incidentally, when David Brown came out here, 
he was a young man that was actually supposed to marry one of James Scott's daughters in, in, in Scotland. But he came out here and Scott had already got his Scottish family at home, but he produced other children by his mistresses in Penang. And his lifestyle was, didn't, didn't please the rather snobbish uh, Colonel MacDonald. But he was a great land grabber and he owned a whole lot of properties right up to where the Turf Club is along Scotland Road. You have and images of the houses, Scotland House, Kelso, and so on. And then in the back is what is we may call it Highlands of Scotland, which was at one time called Gibraltar Hill for some reason. And actually it wasn't James Scott that was living up there, but one of the sons called George Scott, who was also friendly with the Browns. James Scott was a very enterprising guy. Actually, uh, you must remember at that time, it was during the Nap Napoleonic War, and to travel from Britain across uh, to the Cape, across, was quite hazardous. You would have to, f to evade the French ships, otherwise you'd be sunk. But they were also doing gun trading and all sorts of things, and including opium trading, and supplying to people, including, I dare say, the Sultan of Kedah and later to Slango and so on. So opium was used as a kind of uh, sweetener for a lot of uh, business deals. Anyway, James Scott had the ambitious plan of creating a new town as a counter to Georgetown called Jamestown. And I guess most of you know about this. It is in Sungai Kloang, opposite Plau Jaja. And some people claim it's a Buta Uban, but I, I think Sungai Kloang is clearer uh, near a Plaudia But of course, that prospect failed. Anyway, he had his local sons and went into business, and he brought Brown in to take over. So it was Scott Brown and company. But lo and behold, all these activities came to a head where actually he went bankrupt in 1808. Now, I'd like to check on this fact, because this is a reference that's made to the bankruptcy of Scott and company. So they may be grabbing land all over the place, but how did they go bankrupt? Because probably the children also squandered the money. And wait and see what happened to the Brown family. So these are the Kelso houses. Now, this is the James Wharton's first image of Suffolk House in 1811. It showed that Phillips had already acquired the estate, and similarly to to Scott, because Scott was actually the business partner of Francis Wright, who actually was apparently quite uncorrupted. But he left his dealings because he, he was actually complaining about not receiving a good salary. So obviously, Scott provided him with a lot of things. But uh, when Scott collapsed, all these properties had to be sold. It's slightly curious to me, because at that time, La Noonlight was quite riding high, but he could not inherit the property. So it fell to Phillips, who took over and built Suffolk House, Suffolk House, where it was visited not only by Wharton, was incidentally the first tourist writer about Penang and had these views which he produced from Penang Hill, from in fact, from Bellevue. One of the earliest pictures from Penang were from the hill. And the other guy is James George. This is James George's image of Suffolk House, also 1811 when he came as the ADC to Lord Minto, where they were plotting with Stamford Raffles about Bankulan, and the whole uh, question of the Java expedition was hatched in Suffolk House. And James Joss also went up the hill. And the hill, of course, had this house called Strawberry Hill, which not necessarily for growing strawberries, because it's a, a favorite name of the house of that or many houses in that period were called Strawberry Hill. But here you have a very interesting sketch by James George of 1811, looking across to Kedah. So these were the two most important historic paintings acquired by the Penang Museum, and I hope they are in good condition. Anybody from the museum here? So do check it out. The museum we began with a huge repository, but if they've lost all these images, then something should be done. I mean, let's be frank, all institutions have the rise and fall, but this is a time for it not to get to rock bottom, we have to improve the state of affairs.
That's James Watton's view, actually possibly from Bellevue. And there were other views. This is a painting which I hope we can acquire back from the National Museum in KL, which I borrowed from them at that time. And of course, these are what the ships look like. And a ship called Willem Fairley is kind of in interesting because he was actually one of the trustees of Francis Light. And this was painted later. Huggins was a famous maritime painter in UK. And a lot of the ships, actually, they duplicated the picture and gave it different names according to own the ships. It's a good commercial trade in maritime painting. These are some scenes later to show you what Penang might have looked at at that time. Is it clear, the pictures? I can't... If we're too far back, that's how they lived. Uh, this is... Uh, you can conjecture where this was. We were able later to acquire a lot of other images of Penang, like the Belles, the Cree images. And you must remember at that time, this is also during the Opium War. And here, we go back to the Browns. So David Brown came and immediately worked with uh, James Scott and set up later, took over the estate. And he was a lawyer by training in Edinburgh University and a very educated person. He didn't marry Scott's daughter because he's already in Penang, but he took up and had four mistresses. They were never married. So all the children of David Brown were there by bastards. But anyway, let's use the word in uh, in a factual way, not, not as, uh, I mean, there are a lot of bastards around, but they're nicest people you may know. Uh, I thought I'll show you people, and anybody from the library here, David Brown died. This is the list of books he owned. You'd like to have this, Arno? I'd like to show it around. So he was very well educated. He was a lawyer. And, but of course, lawyers are also good at making money, as you know, even the days before the Pandora Papers. <laughs> Look at that. Now, where did all these books go? To the Kadanguni, to Kachang Pute Sellers? Uh, don't forget, the Penang Library and the museum were set up at that time, including Penang Free School. But it's a huge collection for, of course, it didn't list all his other possessions, his uh, 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 furniture and wine containers and whatnot. But those are the books owned by David Brown. You'd like to pass it around. And he was highly educated. But he was liberal and he did so much good for his children. I mean, the fact that he didn't, he didn't marry. Now, who are the wives of David Brown? The first was a lady called Nonia Ennui. Was he a Eurasian? A Chinese or who? Not very clear, but I think she was Eurasian. Now, funny enough, I'm one of those crazy guys that I do research at the last minute. And this morning, I checked a website. And who did I find? A person who was a great grandson of David Graham, the guy who sold all this brown property when they all, uh, and he did not know the history of his parents and the grandparents. And he said that Enui was Chinese and claimed to be descended from there. So we're leading to the yellow brown part. Huh? We did the brown red lights. Now we're coming to the yellow brown part. The first wife was Nonia Anoi, who had the first son is, uh, well, I, I go to history. The second wife, uh, mistress, was Lucy Grace Melang. The Melang family was another Eurasian family and had a son called David Wardlaw Brown, which I'll show you the picture of him later. The third wife was Ing Hu was the sister of his, the keeper of the Sumac Long estate called Ahia. So she was the beginning of the Yellow Browns. The fourth wife was Akim. And again, a very Chinese name, but it's not clear whether she was Chinese or not. So now 
What happened to the Brown estate after David Brown died? The second son, all the sons were sent back. So he actually had the intention to turn the sons into proper Scotsmen. Send all the children back, like, like Sir William, send them back to Scotland to be educated and to lead a good life to take over and therefore become proper Scotsmen. But because they were brought up in the lap of luxury, David Wardlaw Brown was obviously uh, didn't very work very hard. So it wasn't until Forbes caught Brown, the third son, the, the son of the third mistress, and the mother, Nonya Inghui, so came around that he started looking over everything and became one of the most important characters in Penang. He was a justice of the peace. He actually was also on the committee of Penang Free School, Penang Library, and so on. So it's called Force Brown, which is a much more interesting character than David Brown, the father himself. And they had the family estate in Klugor, but they also had a house called Long Formicus, which David Wardlaw Brown bought. And that's where the center of all the Brown people gravitated back there and uh, between the two and leading to whatever happened to their fortune, which will come to later. So this is actually a better image of Blugo House by Cazalette in 1857 by, well, one of the descendant Browns. And you have, to, actually that picture is available because we actually got the reproduction from uh, somebody who reproduced it. And it's available if you want to get a copy. And here is what we've had a photograph. Now, one of the historians that should be celebrated here is the name Donald Davis, who's hardly mentioned today. Do you know the name? Who did most of the historical accounts of Penang and fortunately, at the time when we were doing history, I went to see him. He's an Irish guy living in the Majestic Hotel in a rented room. He had, a, I remember, a Chinese bed. And actually, he allowed me to photocopy the maps and his almost his entire photographic collection of which this came. So we still have that entire Dodo Davis collection. But who's going to look after this hereafter? Now, Donald Davis is a, a bit of a joker, and he went to, whenever he met his lady friends, he would tell them that he actually is unusual because he has a tail. And so naturally, incited them to grope for his tail. And when they said, no, there's no tail, he said, well, you've got the wrong place, it's in front. <laughs> this is a true story of Donald Davis. But he did a lot for Penang history and should be accounted for. In the process, we have also accumulated a lot of information from people who contributed. One a person called Elgin, Ellen Gilpin from Australia who did the whole family history and actually authorized me to publish his account. And there's another lady who is still now in UK called Claire Johnston. They've done an enormous amount of search of the history and actually, I persuaded them to try to do a Brown reunion in Penang. Here is, was the last of the Browns that we knew. He was in Penang Free School, John Brown, during my time. And he migrated to Australia. And we should check whether he's still alive, Dr. John Brown from Penang Free School. So he was one of the yellow, brownish Browns uh, that are in Australia. But really, complexion doesn't matter because it really uh, they were really interesting people. Now, we made the terrible error in the book of describing this as the portrait of David Brown because when we bought it from Sotheby's, they labeled it as a picture of David Brown. So in a new edition, we're going to correct this because it is actually not David Brown. This actually is David Brown. And this is David Wardlaw Brown, the son of the second mistress. And you see, he was obviously living well, never really did any work, and finally died in Longformicus without any children. 
and that's how it fell to the other brother. Uh, and they, they, the, the final fate of Longformica's house at Grugor uh, can be traced to their descendants. Who actually I met, I met the last of the Browns that we could be traced by the name of Helen Miller. The 1995, when I was in Cambridge as a visiting fellow in Emmanuel, and I went to see her, and she gave me copies of almost everything. So we duplicated photographs. And I believe that other people tried to get at it. I don't know whether I've never met Mr. Barber. Is he here? Andrew Barber was also trying to collect the material. But uh, I got the material directly, including the will of Forbes Scott Brown. But this was his brother who uh, bequeathed Longformicus to Forbes. This was a house in Berwickshire which I also visited in 1995. This is what the interior looked like. And the that you can see the wing. Uh, when I went there in 95, they had already sold it uh, to a Mr. Charles, who was not very nice, didn't allow us to go more than into the front room. And he was actually trying to disguise what he was doing because the house was listed under heritage in Britain. It was not allowed to make changes, but he obviously was doing that. But this is, of course, where the house was sold. And you might like to know, the Brown family also went bankrupt and had the bankruptcy debt of $1 million, despite all the efforts of uh, Fox, who actually did his job quite well. Uh, so that's Long Formicus. These are all pictures from Helen Miller. I have to tell you a story I visited there with a lady called Louise Cochran, who's actually the daughter of Morley, the author, the American author, who wrote the, 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 the film made Kitty Foyle, the famous Christopher Morley's daughter. But the funny story was that as you're getting out uh, of the house and getting in the car, she fell and broke her arm. So we could not make the tour further with the center to hospital in Edinburgh. So here is, Fox Scott Brown, looking like a Scottish person, and his wife was Elizabeth Waller. And it's not clear, look at him, this is his actual face. How Chinese can you be? This is the yellow brown. And it's not sure whether he had 11 or 14 children. And no one, the, 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 the wife died at childbirth after the last one. So if you produce 14 children, uh, we have to check whether they were actually 12 or 14. Uh, and when this picture was taken, two of them had died. One of them swallowed a pencil, died at birth, and the other one was drowned. So the rest of the, the group is here. And you want to see the names, they all listed here. But whether it was his Scottish genes or his Chinese genes to produce 14 children, they were so generous, he actually had two illegitimate children before he got married by an unknown person. So they were also part of the family living all together and sent to edu for education in Britain. Well, I, I should add a bit more, but this is Penang Fee School when it was first built, but I'll, I'll go back first. In the will of Forbes Brown, it's very, very interesting because he firstly never mentioned Ing Hu as his mother. And he gave her a sum of money as Nonya Ing Hu, without mentioning her as his mother. Strange, isn't it? And he also gave a bigger amount to an adoptee by the name of Kor Hongbing, who became a very famous person, one of the most famous persons from Penang. Ku Hong Ming. And he wrote this book called The Spirit of the Chinese People. Ku Hong Ming was a cousin of Ko Sien Tak, of Edinburgh House and the Clock Tower. 
And how did he get adopted by Scottsford Brown when he was 14 and claimed to have been to Penang Fee School before? And he was a son of the Krani, the superintendent of one of the estates in Sumai Klong. And it is unclear, and I checked with an author recently who was studying who his mother was, whether his mother was Chinese or Eurasian or Portuguese. But how is it that Fort Scott Brown brought him to study in UK, to go to Edinburgh University, and later he claimed to be studying in Leiden and became quite uh, even fluent in, in German and the, the German literature, Goethe and so on. But when he came back to Penang, he was an outcast because by that time, the family which was descended from the first Kapitan China, Ko, Ko Le Huan was supposed to be the first Kapitan China of Penang and made a lot of money. But uh, three generations later, by the came to that, they were not as rich. So he could not find a job in Penang. He went to Singapore, worked in Singapore for a while, and ended up by working with the Manchu royal family in Beijing and became one of the most famous English-speaking literati in Beijing and wrote this book about. So more famous than Wu Lian Tei, actually, the first Penang guy, Ku Hun Ming. And how many people heard of him? Look it up, it's in a website, the whole study on him. And when I read it, I was so surprised because amongst, he was one of the few English speaking people in Beijing. And one of the people that were his friends was the author of Rashomon, the Japanese author. And he was also visited by Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect, who was at the time doing the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. And when he went over to try to buy artifacts and so on, met Hu Hongming and mentioned it. So there is the Penang connection. So these are the anecdotes. We go to the brown lights and the light yellow browns and the brown browns and so on. But they were very liberal in educating people. So I think I've almost finished my gossip. Uh, Penang Fee School. I, I don't think Marcus is here. Is Marcus here? Since he has got a PhD, he's also not a historian, although he's published so much, and will be my key collaborator for the new edition. Well, Marcus, we can give him an honorary Penang citizenship because he's descended from George Porter. And who was George Porter? The first headmaster of Penang Fee School. So when they set up Penang Fee School, they couldn't find teachers. So finally, the, the guy who founded this, of course, everybody knows, Heaven Hutchings. Now, you know a place called Mount Elvira in Penang? Do you know where Mount Elvira is? It's the second tallest mountain after Western Hill. And who is Elvira? Elvira was the wife of Re Reverend Hutchings. And how did they get that piece of land? And how did they get there in those days? Going up the hill, you walk to ponies and so on, or being carried in sedan chairs. So Mount Elvira, how did it fall in the hands? I mean, maybe they paid him and gave him land instead of his salary. But he was a founder of the school. And one of the, uh, I think probably the first supposed headmaster was George Porter, who had no experience in education. He was actually a gardener from Calcutta. So maybe that's why we did learn botany in Penang Fee School after all. Anyway, that's Marcus' uh, grandparents, so we'll give him honorary Penang status at that. Here is Ku Hong Ming, so I've jumped the gun. I've spun the whole thing around. I hope I've given enough gossip, but they are based on information that I think I have uh, checked on. But the real purpose of this, which I was encouraged, I think, particularly by Xiao Wun, and of course, I, I assume you back it all. Uh, apart from that, we're going to do the new edition under the auspices of Penang Museum, but really is to stimulate historical research, serious historical research by Penangites. It is fine for authors from everywhere to write about Penang history, uh, fictionalize it and all that kind of thing, 
But one of the precepts, one of the things I hope the Penang Heritage Trust is to form a history group and seriously collect information and meet regularly. There were, I, I noticed there were quite a few people interested in history, but you have to come together and create a historical group and also ask what is the status in the Penang Museum, Penang Library, in all the cultural institutions in Penang. So that was the background to why I took up this challenge. And I hope I haven't bored you too much. He hasn't stopped me, but I think I'll stop myself now. Thank you. Well, I had planned to give you an hour and you're right on the dot. So um, in, in our planning, we have half an hour or so for, for anyone to, to carry on the discussion. Uh, but since we're talking about Penang history and, and of course, mentioning Marcus, I might as well start by mentioning this book that we commissioned Marcus Langdon to do a couple of years ago. It's done now and we are launching it on Monday, Monday 4 o'clock. So if you want to talk about it or listen to him talk about it, uh, please come at 4 o'clock. Now, this is interesting. It's right up what you were talking about. Uh, two or three years ago, we decided at Penang Institute that we needed histories of Penang that were not just about politicians and, and people like that. And so this is part of a series that we are going to call Concise Histories of Penang. And the series will deal with any aspect of Penang where we have data to, to talk about. In this case, it's about the uh, it's an agrarian history of Penang, how land was used in the early days and so on. So if anyone feels called upon and who has access to, to good sources and wants to write a concise history of Penang, could contact Penang Institute going forward. Um, um, well, thank you for the gossip and the facts. And, and of course, we know that in gossip lies a lot of information of various quality, of course. <laughs> Um, any any comments, any questions from the floor, please? Uh, Salma? Talking about, uh, I was looking forward actually to the topographical uh, evidence, you know, that about the estate and where actually was the Brown estate. Because I believe that Part of it could be uh, Sungai Ara now, but I'm not sure because, you know, there's Glugok Hill and then there was um, some more estate. I, I remember hearing that, you know, the land around Taimima and all that, that, that used to belong to the Browns and then they left it to the workers. So I would like to, you know, see if anybody can map it out. And then just my, uh, something that I know that might be of interest, that there were Africans who were working there. I think there were Mozambique. Uh, in the Will of Light, there's a reference to Kafirs. Who were the Kafirs? Were they from Africa, Madagascar, or were they already conscripted as sepoys in the Indian army? But they were also used here. The estate was, the final person that owned was Helen Brown. In fact, you can read her account. And in the David, uh, in the will of David Brown, the estates are clearly defined. And I think it shouldn't be difficult. But at the time when I visited Ward, he was living in Sungai Ara in a house uh, next to the military camp, which incidentally was meant to be the site originally of the Penang University that became USM. It was actually on that Sungai Ara road. Then you go in the valley, which is a very interesting valley, all the way in to where there was a, a illegal homestay. And there's a very interesting temple in there. That whole area, the Sungai Ara estate was owned by the Browns. But when they went bankrupt, I'm sure uh, it was taken over by all sorts of people. But it should not be too difficult to identify. And of course, they also own Batu Kawan. And that map, uh, which uh, maybe uh, Marcus should be able to get, uh, part of the information is, was collected by uh, Turnbull Johnson, uh, uh, Turnbull, uh, which actually recorded that uh, that part. I'm, yeah, so uh, you you can get that information quite well, but you really need to have a serious group 
studying history, recording it, getting the documents, which actually should be done by between the Penang Museum and Penang Library. Well, you 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 should be inquiring. You have got Penang Forum behind you. Yeah, but the other thing is, yeah. Uh, okay, the the other thing is that uh, okay, a few few other things because. I did meet uh, Fred Watts when you know when he was quite elderly, and I think at that time he was working for Kennedy Burkill, and Kennedy, Kennedy Burkill, I believe, was managing Helen Brown's estate. You know, but this is all very circumstantial. I don't have anything in writing. And secondly, I also heard that um, you know the various houses of worship. One is the Snake Temple in Sungai Kluang, and that was given to the Chinese community because of one of the Chinese mistresses. And then there was a mosque there, which was also given by the Browns. So they were very generous. Uh, so the site of the mosque was also provided by the Browns, and also the site of the, the Hindu temple. So he, you know, they were very fair, and they gave, you know, a site for all the workers. So that actually is part of the legacy of the Brown family. And yet we know so little about them. Right? Well, you better start working on it. No, indeed, uh, Ward was a guy who gave me that uh, bathtub. So I think, first he find out where that bathtub is and pay to have a bath in it. Uh, uh, one thing which I never mentioned, which I'll test again your knowledge, which is when did Providence Wellesley become part of Penang? And we got the answer? You see, uh, the sensitive... People like Murat Merican, who actually did a lot of interesting studies on light, they went and looked at the original papers in SOAS. Uh, they have a bit of slant against the over-emphasizing of the Brits in the history of Penang. But so few people knew about the whole royal family of Kedah. And it's quite controversial. Uh, when did they become Muslim? Does Anwar have the answer to that one? And more important, during the the, the first the first sultan that liked in legal to get Penang as a post was not the guy who was the next one that was in pride trying to take over Penang. But the third one was with George Lees. They were in a very poor position because what people should know is that at that time Kedah was under the suzerainty of Thailand. And because they did not pay the dues, the Bunga Mas to Thailand, uh, the Thai monarchy asked them to be punished. And who did they use to punish Keda? They used the Bugis from Slango. So in other words, we're looking at this Halcyon landscape from the hill, from Penang Hill, 1820. They were fighting like mad in the plains of Keda. And but by that time, province was already under the British. So some of them took refuge in Province Belsley. And there's a very interesting village called Kuta which actually I went to, maybe you could excavate, you can find some arms and so maybe in the Pride River you can also find a lot of uh, interesting artifacts and so on. So when did Province Wellesley become part of Penang? I just checked it on the website, which incidentally was updated four days ago and mentioning the new governor of Penang. And amongst the personalities they mentioned was Wong Pao Ni, then mention people in Poe, whoever it is, and a lot of other people. But I who wrote it? And according to this, which I was news to me, when George Lee got it in 1800, it was only up to the Pry River. And the rest in the south only came during the Pankor Treaty, which is interesting to me. But what is absolutely missing from that website purporting to be the official history of Province Wells. I hope you didn't write it. No mention of Dimbong Tabal or Bukit Pancho State Park. So now this is not meant to be a negative thing, but if we do not criticize the lapses in information, we are going to contribute to misinformation. So every website has got to be scrutinized. But who are the people in the bureaucracy that's doing it? Do they consult others who may know better? Because, you know, I mean, I have snippets. And if I'm wrong, I'm ready to hear it. We have to look at the negativities before we can get more positive. 
But there it is, the website on Province Wells Street. Updated four days ago, no mention of Nibong Tebal or Bukit Panjo National Park. Do you know where Bukit Panjo National Park is? Penang Park, State Park? Maybe you should do an expedition there. Let's take a trip by Penang Heritage Trust. Apart from your visit to so-called Flagstaff Hill. Um, any other comments? Miss, yeah. A reprints from uh, Smith that you uh, um, would it be a second reprint? Then no, the ten the ten uh, pictures of Captain William Smith. The second reprint. I mean, the, in a set of ten. Yeah, set of ten. Do you have it now? Uh -huh. Okay. Because it was because somebody mentioned that the first edition, the ten copies are now worth five thousand ringgit. Is that possible? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. mm. ah. Okay, any anyone else? Uh, otherwise, yeah. Okay. Here's the side of the bank. Good afternoon. Sun. Yes. Uh, that was three. Good afternoon. You too, uh, uh, Kibe. Uh, you were mentioning that uh, when Francis Light passed away, he had bequeathed his properties to Martina. Now, all those properties, uh, would you know what happened to all those properties after that when they were already in Martina's hands? Thank you. Martina married Timmerman and had three other children. So actually, one of the interesting challenges is for the Eurasian community in Penang and Malaysia to trace the connections from those dates. So, I, but Timmerman was not very reliable, and I think it would be dissipated to them because everything was left to Martina. But of course, you can see that, as I mentioned, uh, by 1811, when Suffolk House was built by Phillips, it was no longer owned by the, the Light family. So uh, I think their financial affairs wasn't very well looked after. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? If not, I, I thought of, yeah, uh, Dr. Sri. Go on, uh, Pradeep. Hi, Dr. Sri. Uh, it appears that there is not much uh, interest from locals uh, in Penang history. If you look at the very few historians like Marcus and uh, maybe Salma, uh, not, not many people are interested. And also you keep calling for um, a formation of a group on history, right? So why, why, why do you think there is a lot of... Um, Ignorance in Penang history. Well, the rise and fall in societal interest. You see, I've been talking to people about the decline in cultural happenings in Penang. When was ever heard of the Rotary Club meeting? All these societies, did they ever meet? What happened to the UCR? What happened to all the organizations? And even we probe the professional institutions like the Institute of Architects. How active are they? There's an absolute decline, but then we have to ask the politicians who are put in charge of this institution, what are they doing to build interest? Seriously, a lot can be done if the museum and the library are really activated into dynamic research institutions, say like Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Kibing came from. It can be done by political edict. You have to rally, but of course, PhD should also shake up itself 
you know, and not just do picnics. Indeed, they should appoint full professionals. There should be a proper archives from Penang. So Pradeep, you should write about this and shake them up. Ask who are the ex-co members in charge, what have they done? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sri. I just want to mention a couple of things. One is, um, I love for folks, thank you for standing the collection uh, list that you have uh, given. Thank you. Uh, one of the most fascinating books that was uh, written about Penang that is hardly known was a book entitled Blood, Believer, and Brother, uh, which was a history of voluntary organizations and civil society in Penang, uh, written nearly half a decade ago. Yeah? Uh, it was done by a research group from the United States and was fascinating. And they covered every single community uh, in Penang uh, and how they had emerged and that Penang really had one of the best records ever of these kinds of, as you can say, voluntary organizations, you can call it civil society uh, in the place. And maybe one day that book can also be talked about. Uh, one of the, the other thing is that those of us who are from free school, uh, we began to feel that only the men were being remembered. Uh, and then we decided that we would actually do a project on Martina Rosels. Yeah? Uh, and uh, my class organized a whole program where we got an actor uh, to actually perform based on a book that was uh, written uh, by somebody from the United States who never completed the book but left the manuscript here. And uh, she was, this was a story being told by Martina Rosels about what happened all around. No? And it's fascinating that you had that kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, book. And we did two performances uh, where uh, we got an actor from uh, Hong Kong uh, for one hour, uh, did a monologue uh, of Martina Rosell's talking from the point of view. So there are unusual things like this where we have brought to life uh, many elements about history. Uh, the third point was about Kedah. I mean, Kedah is neglected by Penang. Uh, when we were actually a baby of uh, Kedah. And the whole history of Kedah uh, and teaching them, about, teaching Penang about them uh, is also, I think, very relevant. And there's a lot of good work early done by Rollins Bonney, uh, you know, about the early history of uh, Francis Light. But the earliest history you were talking about uh, of the, the Kedah civilization of you can say uh, uh, so many Rajas, uh, 30, 40 Rajas, they were actually Hindu, and there was trade between India and, uh, and Kedah. Very prolific trade, and they were bringing spices and other things to Kedah. And one of our biggest exports uh, from North Malaya, from Kedah to India, were elephants. And they were short of elephants in India. Uh, and so Kedah was exporting elephants uh, to, to that. It's quite a lot of documented. Of course, later it embraced Islam. Uh, uh, once Islam came from Laka, and then it, it, it became a, a whole range of sultans. They changed their titles from Rajas to sultans. And I think a lot more work can be done uh, uh, where organically we can look at, uh, at the history. Uh, not many people, for example, visit that famous stone that marks the boundary between Thailand and uh, Penang, or, you know, whatever it is it's called, the stone, no? which is not very far away yeah, uh, from there. So Thailand's claims uh, about uh, uh, over Kedah, uh, again, uh, another story. Yeah? So you got thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I have to override some of your comments, Anwar. Firstly, most people don't realize that when we talk about Kedah, Kedah was part of Thailand. And uh, we actually have a map of Swetanham which showed where the boundary was in the 
uh, 10 treaty, 1910. Yeah, but the, the thing is this, even you didn't realize that it wasn't only Trenganu and Kelantan being part of Nakhon, but also North Perak and Kedah. So uh, we would deal with this controversy of the payment because it wasn't the payment by Penang, it was paid by East India Company. And later during the constitution, it's not paid by Penang State, as far as I'm concerned, it's paid by federal government. So that, that joker doesn't know his history in, in Kedah because if he wants us to be part then we'd be part of Thailand also. Now, you, you told the story about that Martina Rosales. It's actually full of errors, that lady that wrote the stuff, which actually Piki Pekchin tried to promote it as a film. Uh, full of errors. But let us face it, we have to be critical. And even let's look at the state of Penang Free School. Where's the library? A famous school like Penang Free School doesn't got any real history, understanding of its history. So all the institutions have to perk up because Rise and fall of civilizations, we are there, but hopefully we can come up again. But we must understand that we are at the bottom. But you think we're doing well, we are not. So those are things that have to be corrected. But PFS itself, well, I don't know what's happening there. So anyway, if Ku Hong Ming was part of Penang Free School, he should be celebrated, but I don't think many people knew about him. Okay? And that Fox was actually on the committee of Penang Free School. So the study of history has begun with people showing interest and checking information. One of the things I want to mention, for example, uh, the free school itself uh, has done quite a lot of significant work in terms of his own history. I mean, it has got a, a heritage room, it's got a number of archives that have been maintained. And most recently, uh, they've done something that will please you a great deal. And this is that the whole of the school magazine from the beginning until now has actually been digitalized and put into a website so that it can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, anytime. Yeah. That is wonderful news. When did this happen and who knew about it? Kwasing Sun has been doing the history of OFA. Does he know about it? Yes, no. It's just about this. Okay, now this is really a new news because you gave me your copies and I have my own too. Yeah, but who did it? Have they got all the copies? That was three. Uh, one or two still missing. Okay, Kwasing Sun? That was three. Just to inform you, yes, the Old Freeze Association had been working with the school to digitize all the school magazines that they could get their hands on. But as Dato Sri Anwar mentioned, uh, there are maybe perhaps uh, two or three issues uh, that are missing. But yes, it's all up on the web. If you need it, I can let you have the link to it later. Thank you, it's the news. But you see, we are not even connected, although I'm, I'm, I'm an old free, I don't get any news from you guys. So your communication is between Wonky. Yeah. Right. Uh, may, may I try to, with the few minutes we have left, perhaps push the discussion in another direction? I'm, I'm wondering, um, there are two points that you have made that I find important. One is, of course, the need for data, for, for documents and so on, which of course reminds, reminds me and should remind all of us that history basically is about text, right? Even by definition, anything before text is prehistory in a way. So where it comes to Penang, definitely it's about text. But then I, I think your worry is that there is much text, but there is very little access to them. And we, we never know where to go to, to look, look for text and so on. Um, I, I could at this point say, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, I had a long discussion with Professor Wang Gangwu. And of course, he's a historian, like everyone would, would, would say. Um, he had just been awarded, given an award for a recent book for creative nonfiction. Now, most of us would be rather happy about that, but he was a bit confused and even upset because, because he's a historian and he's been given an award for creative nonfiction. Right? <laughs> um, but it, it does lead us to a, a modern discussion, a post social media discussion, perhaps, that uh, creative nonfiction is becoming a thing. In, I think it's a modern term for writing essays in a way, right? But serious essays. Uh, um, 
and back to what you were saying about who is a historian, really, right? Um, historians, I suppose, they, I mean, everyone can be a historian now, I think, really. You don't need to be a PhD. You just need your sources to be written in a certain way. But one, one thing that um, Wang Kang Wu the other day reminded me of was that history, when he started studying, was about archives. It's about written sources. Um, and uh, when he wanted to do a uh, history of diaspora Chinese and so on, so he had this problem of not really having access to, to the right text and so on. So he had to create his own methodology and so on. And of course, that's his great achievement over, over the years. Uh, so in, in a way, it's, it's also up to us who want to be Penang historians that we have to look for the sources um, and where there are no sources, then you have to, well, I don't mean being creative in that, that uh, fictional sense, but creative in a non-fictional sense as well. Um, and also, one, one last point I would like to make. Uh, we, we've been talking about many details about Penang, but they don't make, to my mind, they don't make up history. History needs a context. History needs a format. History needs a project in which, uh, like what Dr. Sri Anwar was saying, how do you make history come alive, right? It's not just, just a series of details. Um, and of course, we already have problems getting details, but once there are the details, we still have to have a story and, and they, they need to give significance to the, to the details as well. We can't <coughs> capture all details that have ever been in, in, in life, of course. Um, that, that's some of the comments I would like to make. But. Well, uh, you thank me to refer to Gangu, my contemporary, and thanks to Eugene, brought me that book. Actually, I tried to get him to come and do a talk here. So he's sending his apologies, he's too old to travel. But we are contemporaries from the first year of the University of Malaya. Now, Gangu is an interesting uh, story, but uh, I want to take the bigger point. Actually, there is a surfeit of information on the internet, and, but very few people know how to screen them to differentiate the authentic from the errors. And a lot of people shout, become very famous, but uh, they are propagating the errors. So although availability on the internet is there, you have to know how to screen it and I identify it because every time I read, even like just this morning, I check a website called Trifty Travelers. Who is the guy? Anybody know him? And he recorded this uh, response from David Graham, the great grandson of David Graham, and who said that his family not interested in the family history. Now, as a result of that contact, even the family uh, members of the family don't get the history right. And frankly, that happens in my own family. I don't know Pauli being here. It is not easy to do that. And don't think that because it's printed, what is needed is a peer group of people working together that disseminate. Now, when you talk about Penang Free School uh, thing, who knew that you started this project? Who is on your team? Right? Now, without wanting to stick my neck because I've got other things to do, it would have been interesting to know when you were looking at it because you gave me your copies of the Penang School magazine and I have some from my brother. But even today, people in the school do not know the history. That's what when I mentioned George Porter, and Hutchings and so on. So the the I actually had a talk yeah. by Marcus Langdon in the school, the whole series of what we call the Penang stories. Yeah. yeah. So I think sometimes I find that you may be a hermit with a great deal of knowledge, but may not be connected with things happening and something is missing. Yeah. Uh, with regard to yeah. all the activities, the Penang story lectures that have been well, given over the last ten years about every unusual thing about hap happening and uh, relationships and so on. So I think maybe, as you say, uh, the circle for sharing yeah. uh, must be enlarged. Uh, and, That's and right. We must meet you more often. No, 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 no. I'm happy to retire. It's just remarkable, you know. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to retire, but I hope you have a good new team. A new team. It's a new team that is important in every area. But let us address the two institutions the Penang Museum and the Penang Library. Because whether it's true or not, one day, somebody who may, may be in the audience 
came to me and said, you want some books? They're giving away books from Penang Library. And we heard that stuff from Penang Museum being sold. What is happening? So that calls for an investigation. So who on the museum board? Who's the chairman? You need a very active archival group in those institutions. And then similarly, even your network in, in PFS and OFIS need to be improved. Do you know Lee Kai? Lee Kai, Lee Kai. Lee Kai or Lee Kai? Lee Kai. Oh, he's only interested in art and his own collection. Sorry, I have to talk this way, but I hope this privilege, since I'm supposed to be retired and my time is limited, I thought I'd use this chance to activate you, even if you hate me. <laughs> well, I, th I think we are very grateful for your talk today and for your attempt to, 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 to stimulate, uh, to stimulate his, uh, his interest in Penang history. Um, but thanks again, Datu Sri, for, for gracing Penang Institute. And I'll hope you'll be doing it, it again soon. Yeah. So, uh, well, we have thanked him already without being, being told to. So, well, thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. Oh, and the prints are there for sale and so on. And a lot of books as well. Yeah, thanks for coming.